Well, thanks to all of you for coming, and Dan, thanks uh, as well for your, your presence here. And this is, uh, his book came out yesterday. And maybe just to make a quick comment, um, I, I just immensely enjoyed this book. And um, it was, uh, I think, a, it, it just almost breaks your heart to make you realize what a long and often frustrating experience uh, the relationship between China and the U.S. has actually proven to be. And in this book of George Marshall, uh, you know, an, a, a man who just sort of seems the personification of everything about the greatest generation, about the best of America, you know, smart, modest, temperate, uh, dedicated, duty, discipline, you name it. I mean, here was a man who was chief of staff of the Army, uh, had a huge role in World War II, uh, came home. Truman said, would you go to China? And he went to China for a year and a half, two years, and this incredible story, which we'll talk about, went home again, wanted to retire, became Secretary of State, and didn't he become sec Secretary of Secretary Defense? Secretary of Defense a few years later. Uh, and never wrote his memoir because he didn't want to sort of promote himself too grandly and sp do any hagiography. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you read about this guy, George Marshall, and you look at what's going on today, and it just makes you want to weep. And you wonder, wonder where this America has gone. And this man who struggled so mightily to try to bring the factions in China together. So let's turn to that. So Dan, here we are, the end of the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, and the peace proves as difficult as the war. And the communists and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, Mao and the communists, have been kind of quiescent during the war. And suddenly, the issue is, how's our ally, the nationalists, and Chiang Kai-shek going to deal with this uh, incipient civil war? And Dan's written the book. So set the scene for us. Right. So at, at, the, at the end of World War II, um, George Marshall, as you say, Orville, is um, one of the most towering figures in the world. He's been Army Chief of Staff for six years. Um, he has been one of the key uh, allied leaders who, who leads the victory over the Nazis and Japanese. Um, he has this just incredible public profile in the United States. Uh, there is a draft Marshall movement pressing him to run for president uh, after, after he leaves the army. And he is also um, esteemed probably more than any other leader at the time by Churchill, by Truman. Um, when Marshall's getting to, ready to retire, Truman calls him the greatest military leader that has ever lived. But Marshall is about to turn 65 years old. He's just uh, had this incredibly grueling six years leading the army during World War II. He actually took over as chief of staff the same day that Hitler invaded Poland. So he has kind of lived this entire, the entire history of the war. And um, Marshall's wife, Catherine, has planned their vacation. They're kind of ready for retirement. So the day, the day after his retirement ceremony, they drive to their house outside of Washington, D.C. in Leesburg, Virginia. And um, they walk through the door, and almost minutes later, uh, the phone rings. And it turns out it's Truman on the phone. And Tr Truman says to Marshall, I, just, I need one last favor from you. I know you're supposed to be retiring, but I need you uh, to, do, to do one more thing for me. And Catherine Marshall is furious because she knows that um, Marshall will not be able to say no. He has this kind of deep sense of duty. And uh, lo and behold, Marshall does not say no. Now, for, for Truman, um, who has become president sort of accidentally in April 1945, um, China and the, the growing civil war there represents this gigantic problem that is not just a China problem for him, but threatens to kind of upend his whole vision for what the post-war is supposed to look like. We had thought about China as one of the great powers that was supposed to uphold the, the post-war peace along with the, the U.S. and the U.K. and the Soviet Union. But at the time, um, Zhang and the nationalists, who are the, the central government, have a pretty tenuous hold or, or reestablishing a tenuous hold over most of Chinese territory as the Japanese um, surrender. And the Russians have moved into Manchuria. That's right. The, Russia, the Russians have, have invaded Manchuria in the, the last days of the war. And... Mao and the communists are also vying for control. So, so Truman sees um, this threat both to peace in China, but also this threat to the whole post-war 
post-war vision that that he um, he has been banking on at a time when he has a ton of problems at home, when the economy is shrinking and there's terrible inflation and there are strikes. So, so Truman, um, knowing that Marshall is the man who has probably done more than anyone else to win the war, says, you know, you, you are the one who's going to save the peace for me. So he, he calls Marshall. He asks him to fly to China, um, broker a peace between these two sides who have been at war on and off for 20 years at this point, and to leave behind the, the um, groundwork for a U.S. allied Chinese democracy that has both sides um, in the government. And Truman sort of wishfully says to Marshall, I think this is just going to take you a couple of months. Um, and so Mar- Mar- Marshall flies over in December 1945. And, Which is um, no small no, thing in itself. That's right. It's a six-day six trip kind of hopping from island to island across the Pacific. Um, and, you know, rather than this marking um, a brief delay in Marshall's retirement, he ends up um, because of the China mission going on to become Secretary of State to being the, the namesake of the Marshall Plan, the person who you know, pushed the Marshall Plan, which you know, probably stands today as the most successful American foreign policy initiative ever. Um, he becomes Secretary of Defense, as you say. It's to his wife's great chagrin another six years before he actually retires. So here's this man who's just been through World War II and just getting ready to start weeding his garden. And the next thing he knows, he's landing in Chongqing, in China, which is way up the Yangtze River, a city that is miserable winter and summer. It's cold, wet, and rainy, and, and, and horrific in the winter. And in the summer, it's brutally hot. And he is thrown the task of, with Mao Zedong up in the hills of, of Yan'an, and Chiang Kai-shek in Chongqing, where he has fled during the war. So tell us what happens, Dan. So, so Marshall's a pretty hard-headed guy and realizes that he has a hard task ahead of him. But um, because of the, the kind of character he is, he, he gets there and immediately throws himself into, into this mission. Um, and he, he quickly says, as he's writing, um, writing home to his wife and others, I'm working as hard here as I, as I worked during World War II. So he, he um, sets himself into this task of, first of all, brokering a peace in the Civil War, so getting a, a ceasefire in um, what is a growing civil war between the two sides. He um, pushes a plan and ultimately gets both sides to agree to combine their armies into one, one national Chinese force. And then he works quietly behind the scenes to create what is, you know, as he, what, as he sees it, is a kind of Chinese constitution. So he um, hands Zhang a, a kind of draft bill of rights um, that is supposed to become the kind of basis for this uh, democratic China modeled on the United States. And one thing that was so remarkable to me is I um, spent time digging into his papers and the papers of, of his aides around him is how swept up he was in this moment. You know, he, he did not think it was going to be easy, but as he gets this ceasefire, he gets this, um, this Bill of Rights accepted, he gets this plan to combine the armies, you can and see And both him. sides. He's and, got the, right. the communists on the one hand and the nationalists on the other. That's right. So, he, so he, he kind of sits at tables with them and hour after hour hammers out these agreements. And within a couple months of his arriving in China, there's this whole alternate future that he can, he can see his way to, where there's, uh, there's peace in China. China kind of takes on um, the role of a pillar of post-war peace. And you know, as they see it at the time, uh, Mao and Zhang were going to serve as kind of a bridge between the Americans and Soviets rather than a source mm-hmm. of, of great distress. And at the kind of um, uh, climactic moment of this, this first phase of the mission, he, uh, he travels around, around China going to all of these spots that have been um, you know, at war for 20 years, essentially, whether it's between the, the two Chinese factions or between the Chinese and the Japanese. Mm-hmm. And he, he shows up and he um, kind of hammers out these local peace agreements and is um, welcomed by crowds who, you know, hold signs deeming him the god of peace. There are columnists in the U.S. talking about how Marshall has saved China. Um, even Stalin at this point, at the, at the very beginning, um, sees Marshall as kind of so commanding in this vision, as um, so, so persuasive that Stalin tells Mao that he has to, he has to cooperate. So finally... Marshall at the end of this tour around China um, shows up in, in Yunnan, where the, the communists have been since the end of the Long March in this kind of very desolate place protected by this um, uh, forbidding landscape of ravines. And, and Marshall and Mao meet. 
and talk about this peaceful future. They talk about uh, the communists coming out of the wilderness and setting up their headquarters back in the cities and joining a government led by, led by the nationalists. And there's this moment when people in Moscow, around China, and in the U.S. really see that as a plausible future. I mean, now just let's mark this moment because this is like a Greek tragedy, of course. You, right. you, everything's just chugging along and then suddenly it, right. it turns. So, uh, I mean, describe a little what, what it was like. I mean, uh, I mean for, for Marshall to fly off to where, where Mao was, um, that was not like going to Detroit. Uh, that was an entirely different universe. And wh wh what does he find there? So, I mean, just to, to, to put a fine point on that, Marshall's flying around in this um, C-54 Army transport plane that had been given to Churchill during the war and outfitted in kind of high uh, British gentleman's club um, style. Um, but, but, the, but the C-54, as he is flying to, um, to meet Mao, actually gets lost for a moment it, because there's the no landscape radar, is right. No. There's no radio. Um, <laughs> it's this uh, kind of treeless, barren landscape with these kind of intersecting ravines. And so there's this moment um, where you can read uh, the account, the kind of diaries and, and letters from some of the aides who had been on the plane where they think, man, we're going to have to you know, jump out of this plane in a parachute because we're not, we're not going to find this capital, mm -hmm. which just kind of goes to show how, how remote it was. Um, but, but he lands there. And the communists at this moment, when um, uh, they are kind of exploring the possibility and have kind of committed to joining this new uh, the coalition government and kind of committing to this, this alternate future, um, have put together this incredible welcome ceremony for Marshall in an attempt to persuade him they really are serious about, about, about playing along and about joining, joining a new government. So he, he lands, and there's a gigantic band that welcomes him to... Um, to, to Yan'an that has composed a song for him about uh, how, how Marshall has saved China. Um, they've, they've worked with some of the American officers who had been stationed there during the war to put, to put together a map room for him so that he'll think they're serious about, uh, about, about they're their They're living in caves plans. in this sort right. of earth countryside, the, the loose soil. Right, and there's no you know, minimal electricity, very simple food, but he, he, he sits down in, the, in this place with Mao and has this kind of incredible conversation about um, all the great things that they, they will do together. And, and you know, Mao, who's uh, very adept at kind of saying what Marshall wants to hear um, at this time, is talking about how he's eager to visit the United States and learn about you know, uh, US free enterprise and science and agriculture. <coughs> um, and, and so you have this 24-hour visit uh, when Marshall kind of tours around communist headquarters talking about the future, and it turns out that this is the last time Mao would meet with a senior-level American like this for 25 years until Richard Nixon uh, flies to China mm -hmm. in 1972. And in the meanwhile, uh, back in Chongqing, which is sort of the headquarters of the nationalists and where all the media are and all the diplomatic missions, uh, there is Zhou Enlai and his fedora, his cravat, his natty right. kind of uh, diplomatic getup, and tell us about him. So, I mean, between so many of the characters on on all sides of this are um, so kind of distinct and and fascinating in their own right. So you have, you know, Mao who who does a very good job of welcoming Americans to Yan'an and kind of showing them that he's this kind of um, you know farmer boy scout who. Uh, um, is is just the kind of um, you know Jeffersonian Democrat they, they dream of seeing. Um, Joe is kind of uh, shows a very different side, um, but that appeals to a different set of Americans. He's he spent time in Paris. Uh, he's he's well read. He's debonair. He's articulate. He's incredibly charismatic. And he and Marshall um, establish for the, the the first stretch of this mission this incredibly close relationship mm -hmm. where they're spending hours and hours and hours together. And again, you can see when you read um, what, what Joe is saying to Mao and what he's saying to Marshall, there, he's, he's not being entirely honest, as, as we've later learned. But in this moment, he's telling Marshall exactly what he wants to hear. And Marshall, you know, as he starts to see the, um, the, the, the kind of character behind this diplomat, um, really sees Joe as one of the most kind of sophisticated and craftiest people he's ever met. 
I mean, that was certainly Kissinger's experience. That's right. Too. That's right. So, I mean, this is really the apogee of that American sense of not, uh, not only can do, but American power, and also this notion that somehow Americans can catalyze any situation, right. sort of evangelize, not only bring competing sides together, but as you pointed out, Dan, within this whole presumption was that they were going to bring about this democratic right. government in China. And so, oh, so no, I, was, I mean, I was just going to say that there's, there are these moments in these first months of 1946, you know, just a few, few years really before everything goes in the opposite direction where you have Marshall um, reading Benjamin Franklin's speeches to Chinese communists, uh, telling them that this is going to be the model for their political future. He um, at one point goes to visit the director, Frank Capra, who's about to film It's a Wonderful Life. And, and did that film about the World War II that's in right. Europe. So they, they had worked together during the war, and Marshall goes to Capra and says, I want you to produce a series of instructional videos in Chinese teaching the Chinese people how to be good Democrats. And did he? Uh, they, they, it, it never happened. But um, be great there was a whole... To... There was, yeah, there, were, there was this whole plan. You have all these kind of amazing um, Hollywood names uh, trying to work together to put these films together. And as the kind of hopes yeah. started to dwindle, the whole project fell, fell apart. But it kind of um, goes to show you just how swept up Marshall was in that evangelical fervor for democracy. I mean, and there is something, I think, um, is there not very American about this idea that if you just, it's sort of the, the evangelical notion, if you can just get them in front of the good book, right. you know, the scales will fall from their eyes. Right. And, and they say, Marshall and, and, and lots of others say at the time, well, we have Democrats and Republicans, and we manage to get along, or, you know, <laughs> Northerners and Southerners hate each other, too, and we manage to get along, so... I don't see why the nationalists and communists shouldn't be able to. Now, this raises, now, uh, this raises a very, I think, important question. Um, so George um, Marshall, uh, I think it was he who referred to himself as a referee in China's civil mm -hmm. war. Yeah. So that's a kind of an interesting role for him to, him, him to be playing. Um, I mean, one of the big questions that I found myself asking every page, and we'll get in a minute to what happens, which, of course, just so that you don't, get too hopeful is a complete disaster. Uh, um, I mean, do you think Marshall was naive in that uniquely American way that we think we can do this, we think people will see it if they can only see it? I mean, how, how do you look back now on this book? If you were advising Marshall, what would you have said to him as he was going out there on that first leg? So, so what is amazing about the kind of the, the arc of Marshall's story is when he begins, he's, he, he is fairly skeptical. He's not a, you know, he's a pretty hard-headed guy. He's been through, um, uh, he's seen a lot of the world. He's, he lived in China for three years earlier in his life, in the 1920s. In um, Manchuria. In, in, in Tianjin. And, in he, and, he, tra and he traveled around yeah. Manchuria um, after he had, he had a nervous breakdown when he was in his 30s. Um, and, and took some time off. Uh, That's uh, where I'd go if leave. I was having a nervous right. So, so, so he goes and he, he rides horses around Manchuria um, for several months. Um, but he, he's, he's skeptical at first, but then as he sees these kind of surface agreements in his first months, he is, is swept up in that kind of uh, evangelical fervor. And for, you know, probably six, six weeks of this mission, you read a lot of what he's saying, and it's hard, it's hard not to cringe. Um, he, you know, talks about, he uses these kind of um, corny American analogies, and I'll talk about kind of baseball analogies, and uh, he, he at one point hands, um, hands John the, this draft of a, a Chinese Bill of Rights, and he says, this is a good dose of American medicine, and he thinks that, um, And John you know, takes it. He, t he takes it, but, but um, you know, Marshall says, oh, they'll, they'll think that's funny. In fact, they're fuming when they hear this, which is entirely understandable. But mm -hmm. for this period, Marshall, Marshall really is swept up. And, uh, you know, he certainly, he, he certainly is not unique in that, though. And what, what was very striking in, in looking back through the records of that time is that a lot of people who later claim to have thought the whole way through this was a terrible idea were swept up in it, too. So people like... Henry Luce, who was the founder of, of Time and Life and the son of missionaries in China and became one of the um, kind of harshest critics of Marshall's and, uh, and others like him a few years later, you see him writing letters to Marshall saying, I think you're doing exactly the right thing. 
you've done a great job, you've totally saved the situation. Um, and, and that's true across the political spectrum in the United States. So uh, Marshall can certainly be faulted for that, but it, it was not just him. I mean, I think it's important to ask these questions and we can't answer them because sort of inherent in this whole book, and of course in every book about China is, can you do business with the communists? And, and this story ends very sadly with McCarthy, where the conclusion is you certainly can't, and anyone who tries is a traitor and naive and very foolish. So it, it, it's, let me ask you that question mm -hmm. now, and then we'll get to the, to the, to the denouement of the story. D do you think um, it was actually possible at this moment in history to do business with the Chinese Communist Party? So, there's, so st stepping back from just the China story for a bit, there's a really important change in the global conditions as this story is proceeding. Um, a few months war. after the war, right. The, so, the, so when Marshall goes, um, there is still hope in, in Moscow and in Washington for um, a kind of, you know, a, a one world future. There's still uh, this notion that the big four in the United Nations will um, avert, avert a Cold War. And people are just starting to wonder what U.S.-Soviet tension means and what it, what it will mean going forward. Um, when, when Marshall first arrives, Stalin tells Mao, treat Marshall like he's a representative of all the world powers. You have, mm -hmm. to, you have to cooperate. And it's only a couple of months later that the first signs of what becomes, we know now, is the Cold War um, really start to emerge. So in, in, in February, about six weeks after mm -hmm. Marshall has landed, Stalin gives a very famous speech, um, a very kind of hard-edged speech on, on Army Day, I believe, on February 9th, 1946. Um, and, and that prompts George Kennan to write the long telegram, which ultimately would become passed around uh, around Washington as the kind of first document laying out U.S. strategy in, in the Cold War. And lead um, to containment. And lead to containment, right. So um, so you, you have these trends. Winston Churchill, the same day, I mean, kind of an, an amazing um, historical accident, the same day that Marshall is in Yan'an talking to, to Mao and kind of celebrating this, this peaceful future, uh, Winston Churchill is in Fulton, Missouri, where he gives what is now a very, very famous speech talking about the Iron Curtain falling between, between the West and the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And of course, the communists are watching that and trying to decipher mm -hmm. um, how the world is turning. And it's really as the Cold War starts to take shape that the two sides in, in China start to change uh, their attitude towards Marshall. So at first, when they think uh, there might really be this one world future, they think they might have no choice to play along. And that's why yeah. Marshall can get done what he, what he gets done. It's when those dynamics start to change, Stalin's messages to Mao start to change, um, that things really fall apart. And this is where Marshall, because he's been so swept up in the possibilities of this moment and seeing what that alternate future could look like, has a very hard time recognizing that there's been a fundamental change in the ways that both the communists and the nationalists are treating him. So he um, all of a sudden becomes, you know, he's been... Uh, celebrated, welcomed by, by both sides, and then all of a sudden communist propaganda starts to attack him. And he can't figure out why it is. He keeps thinking there must be some mistake, and if he can only do, you know, make one more trip or have one more meeting, make one more kind of public statement, he will be able to turn them around. And it's that kind of failure to recognize the turn that really keeps him in China um, mm -hmm. struggling against this reality. And as I recall, at this period, I think the Chinese Communist Party had adopted this new democratic theory, which meant basically suspend Marx, right. class warfare, right. struggle against landlords and things, cooperate with the middle class, the bourgeoisie, because we have to fight Japan, and just kind of keep your head down. Right. And then, of course, when the war ended, uh, it was very deceptive to people uh, because they thought, well, maybe uh, these communists are just agrarian reformers, you know, idealists. Right who want to kind of level the playing field a little, but didn't quite realize that this was a tactical pause right. that they had gone on. So, so Marshall, you know, there's this, as, as you know very well, there's this amazing um, set of young Americans who travel to communist headquarters and are really taken in by, by mm -hmm. that, um, that kind of line of propaganda in that period. And there are these kind of accounts of people coming back, including kind of, you know, American military officers and diplomats saying, these guys aren't communists. They're, um, you know, they're just like good old American farmers. And if we just kind of uh, uh, treat them the right way, 
they're going to come around to our side. Um, you know, in one kind of a, a amazing historical detail, um, a, a Marine goes to, goes to visit them and is so kind of taken in by what he sees that he takes what is a Communist Party work slogan, gung-ho, and makes that the battle cry of the Marine Raiders, which um, was, was kind of shocking to me. Um, Marshall was not taken in by that line, actually. He, he was never convinced by those who argued that the communists were not really communists, and he would say it again and again at the time. You know, I, I've, I've talked to Joe and I about this, and he, mm -hmm. he professes uh, Marxist beliefs, and I believe that they're right. What Marshall thought is that if he could use this moment to bring them into uh, the political system, they would be um, made digestible, as, as he would put it at the time. They, they would uh, be forced to play by different rules, and that, over time, would change them. But well, it was not an illusion about what they were saying. Not too dissimilar, I might add, from what we've seen in China in more recent decades, where the idea of, you remember the old saw, open markets will equal open right. society. Just get the stock exchange in there. Right. Just get, you know, Morgan Stanley and, 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 and all will come up roses politically. Right. I mean, there was that kind of belief in the holistic nature right. of things. Yeah. That, uh, um, I wonder, uh, as, as you look back on this now, uh, do you think there was anything that Marshall could have done now, he left just as things looked really great, and, and it looked like he worked them right. out largely, and he, then he had to come back again. Right. So he, he, he leaves not because he thinks his mission is done, but after uh, about two and a half months, um, already longer than Truman said it would be, he, he has a set of agreements, and, and he says, okay, there's going to be this, this uh, unified Chinese government. But to really make it work, we need a massive assistance plan. We need a huge amount of, of economic assistance. And uh, the U.S. Congress at the time was not feeling very generous. It, it had just spent a ton of money on the war. It's been he wanted a Marshall sending. plan he for wanted a, China he wanted a Marshall before plan for he China. did it for Europe. Right. So he, so he goes back to Washington thinking that he has <coughs> these agreements in place and starts uh, for a month lobbying Congress, just kind of s sitting there with... <coughs> Uh, U.S. officials and politicians making the case for a really enormous aid package for um, for the Chinese, what would amount to, as a percentage of GDP, tens of billions of dollars. And it, it's it's then, right as he's kind of putting together this Marshall Plan for the new China, that that things start to come apart. And so he goes back and spends another uh, another nine months on this mission first. Trying to put back together these agreements that he's got, that he that he had in place um, at the beginning, but then it fell apart. But then, uh, really, for the last few months, is is less focused on this vision of a Chinese future than he is on trying to persuade the nationalists that they need to take a different approach if they're going to win. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems to me that as we look at this in the beginning, sort of the the the. the nationalists, well, well describe the, the pattern as you see it. I mean, who is at fault in sort of precipitating a collapse of these agreements? I mean, it's sometimes it's one side, sometimes right. it's another. And then finally, how do you assess major, the major portion of blame for this thing falling apart? This peace agreement, they'd have a collective government, they slowly the communist troops would be absorbed into the nationalist army and they'd give up their occupied territory. Right. Et cetera, et cetera. So how, how do you parse that? So, 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 so the way that Marshall approaches, he saw kind of two uh, interlinked problems. One, one was that you had a national government led by the nationalists um, that the communists wanted to be part of. And two, you had these, these two armies. Mm -hmm. And um, he saw a trade-off there in, in exchange for giving up, for the communists giving up their weapons and becoming part of a, a, a national army they would be given a role in government. And so he tried to kind of choreograph things in a way that these would happen at exactly the same time. Um, the nationalists had good reason not to let the communists into their government. The communists had good reason not to give up their weapons until they were assured a place in, mm -hmm. in, in, in a government. So both start stalling, especially once they see Cold War dynamics starting to, to play out. So. Um, it's, it's really, as, as Marshall concludes, you have to blame both sides. And there are moments early on where um, the nationalists are a little bit more recalcitrant. And, you know, there is, you, you could kind of trace an alternate future where um, earlier cooperation would have brought a different outcome. But ultimately, both sides um, 
really start to kind of go back on their commitments. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of uh, uh, blame one cleanly. And then I think in the back of John kai mind is, of course, always if push comes to shove and this right. thing falls apart, what's Washington going to do? We're their ally, right. wartime right. ally. They're going to walk away from China and turn it over to the communists? N- no. Right. And he, and he has pretty good reason for thinking this. I mean, one um, a kind of amazing historical detail, Marshall um, meets with Truman before leaving and has this conversation where he says, look, I'm going to try to bring the two sides together, but what should I do if it's not working? And then, and it's and what if it's not working because the nationalists are not doing what I try to get them to do? What leverage do I have? And true men and others keep trying to kind of evade this question, but Marshall keeps pushing. What do I do if it doesn't work? What do I what do I do if it doesn't work? And Truman says to him, "Look, ultimately, we're going to have to back the nationalists at least in part." And Marshall says, "Okay, I will keep that in mind, but we will, we will keep that a secret." That detail leaks from the White House conversation and makes its way to Chongqing before Marshall's even arrived. So Zhang has kind of good reason for saying, look, even if I don't do what Marshall tells me I have to do, uh, there's good reason to think the Americans are still going to back me. And that impression is reinforced by lots of other Americans that he's talking to. He talks to Henry Luce and, and other politicians who tell him, look, we see what's happening in, in Washington. There's kind of fear of communism that is really going to change the way American policy is made. So just just wait, just deal with Marshall, but ultimately you will be backed in your fight against the communists. And he you know, bets that that is true, and he's in part right and in part wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was great ambivalence, right. because right. Americans wanted to get out of the war, bring troops right. home, you know, get back to peacetime, and, right. and then they get dragged into this. But, but you see, sorry, just to add a, another detail, you know, you kind of see the first... Um, attempts to work out what would become domino theory in the Cold War right, right. at this moment. So, um, you know, you, can, you, you have all these Americans who can't quite find the right analogy, but they'll talk about, you know, a snowball of communism rolling down the hill, or um, a member of Congress talks about it as a baseball game with communism reaching first base in, in China, then second base in India, third base in Africa. And you kind of, you want to shake them and say, do- dominoes is the analogy you're looking for. But, um, Do you think they were yeah. right? Um, they, they, they were right in certain parts of the Asia periphery, but they were not right about the kind of global implications. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, it, you know, it, it seems to me that if one is looking for sort of, uh, 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 you know, fortune cooking messages in your book, uh, or at least the question I would ask is, you know, are there civil wars in which intrusion is warranted and, can, and has succeeded? What, what civil wars are, 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 can you think of that where the United States has done what they were unable to do in right. the Chinese civil war? Yes. Yeah, so so, so this, this, in a way, becomes um, our, our first attempt to do something that we would try to do again and again and again through the Cold War and beyond and almost always fail. Where did we uh, succeed? Um, we succeeded in the Balkans, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, where, we, where we never succeeded, especially during the Cold War, was anywhere... Um, where, the, uh, where either side had outside backers who did not want to settle. And that ultimately becomes the kind of problematic dynamic here, that the Soviets, um, who at first, at the beginning of Marshall's mission, are willing to support a peace, mm-hmm. start to increasingly support now as the end comes. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are, I, I mean, I guess the British in Malaya, Malaya won a... a br- but with a brutal counterinsurgency right. and a lot, a lot of power. And, and part of what Marshall starts to... Um, think about as, as he sees the failure of what he's been sent to do is just what it will take to what, what kind of application of American power will be required mm-hmm. to make a difference. And as mm-hmm. he assesses that and looks at uh, the extent of the problems, the resources that are available in the United States at the time to, to, uh, to take those problems on, that it's a, a level of commitment that we would never make. So uh, do you take away as a kind of a, an a, a, a admonition or a message from your research that it, it, it is not a, a viable strategy to intrude in someone else's civil that, war? That I would have a, a lot of, uh, we should have a very high degree of humility about our, our yeah. ability to do that. And it's, you know, I, I think powerful for me that this is a lesson that comes through Marshall, who, um, as he becomes <coughs> Secretary of State, really comes to kind of embody a kind of ambitious American leadership Mm-hmm. Um, that, and we still kind of think of him in those terms today, but 
a really important part of his um, approach to this this time period was this lesson in kind of restraint. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, we went on, and whatever lesson was learned uh, by Marshall didn't seem to be very well learned by right. many others. <laughs> right, right. And uh, I heard an interesting fact that a friend, when I told him I was going to be talking with you about this book, he said, did you know that we've spent more money in Afghanistan than on the entire uh, Marshall Plan in, in, in Europe? That's a pretty shocking right, number, right. and I would say not towards such good end. Right. Uh, so, 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 Mar so Marshall leaves, um, leaves China in January 1947, immediately becomes Secretary of State, <clears throat> and is suddenly faced with a whole world of problems, some of which look not entirely dissimilar from what, what he saw in China. And um, the, the Marshall Plan, which is uh, at the time a $13 billion um, aid package for Western Europe, um, which as a percentage of GDP would be a trillion dollars today. So yeah, I think we spent um, about that in Afghanistan. Um, right, but, that, but that's a, you know, compared to our, our development assistance and economic assistance right. at this point is, is enormous. Um, Marshall kind of looks, looks at the extent of challenges around the world and decides that that is the place where um, that kind of American investment is likely to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the kind of American political system more broadly learns exactly the opposite lesson from, you know, Marshall's experience in China and what happens in the aftermath. The, the quote-unquote loss of China in 1949 becomes one of the most poisonous and powerful forces in American politics through the 50s. And, you know, one thing that I was surprised to find as I, as I um, first started researching this was that... Uh, Joseph McCarthy's famous speech where he talks about a conspiracy so immense and infamy so black, mm -hmm. which is really the beginning of McCarthyism in the United States as a, as a powerful political force, was an attack on Marshall, in, in part because of this mission. Mm -hmm. And that becomes um, a, an incredibly powerful force in American politics in the, the 1950s. It's what Lyndon Johnson is thinking about in the 1960s when he starts sending U.S. troops to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, you know, look at what happened to those guys who lost China that's going to be, um, quoting Johnson, that's chicken shit compared to what they're going to do to us if we lose Vietnam. So even as he's relatively skeptical, as we know now, of what an application of, of, of sending U.S. troops to Vietnam is likely to do, he still sees the political costs as more than he can handle. And even until into the 1980s, you see references to the loss of China as justification for uh, U.S. interventions elsewhere. So you worked in the State Department more recently in the mm -hmm. policy planning staff. So if you and you're doing this research, presumably while you were doing that, um, how do you look sort of in retrospect on that august role which America has always imagined itself as, as being the, the matchmaker, the peacemaker, mm -hmm. the, the one who intercedes? Do you think that uh, that we've been naive in our presumption that we can both negotiate our way out or we can uh, fight our way out by joining into a civil strife. Right. So, um, as you say, this, the, the, this book was really hatched when I was working in <clears throat> the policy planning staff, which Marshall created. So Marshall remains this kind of touchstone when you, when you work in policy planning. Um, and so does the Marshall Plan, which was the kind of first great project of, of the office. And you know, to this day is referred back to in kind of with um, hilarious frequency. You, know, you kind of get calls from both outside commentators and your bosses to kind of come up for a Marshall Plan for everything you can think of. So, you know, the problem of Central America, Marshall Plan, Southeast Asia, Marshall Plan. Um, now there are calls for a Marshall Plan for Middle America. Um, the, you know, as, as I kind of fielded those calls and, you know, you kind of roll your eyes when you're, when you're on the staff and you hear, you know, a New York Times columnist telling you to come up with a new Marshall Plan, um, looking at these kind of other uh, experiences of Marshall, especially in this period, seemed in some ways much more instructive. To the, the question about uh, the U.S. role in civil wars, you know, there, there's one lesson about um, the limits of U.S. military force and advice to uh, solve other people's civil wars. There's also um, a lesson about the limits of, of diplomacy in that we have um, a very high estimation of our own good intentions and assume others will see our intentions in the same way. So Marshall is on the one hand here to referee this dispute between the two sides, but we are not, uh, we are not disinterested brokers. We, he also is there to support one side in, in the Civil War. And 
that is something that we as Americans think that you know p- people will kind of accept that we we really want the best and have no um, e- even though we may be prejudiced right in, toward one side as right. we're trying to right. negotiate a which That's is right. certainly the case and and ab- ab- absolutely yeah. so I forget who says this. Um, that China is a graveyard for American officials. <laughs> um, so if we uh, take that little um, aphorism uh, and apply it to today, do you think it has any application? So, um, <laughs> it, it, you know, we're, we're at a moment of collective dismay about the failure of China to conform to our expectations. And it was ever thus. Right. But, but you know, I think for... A lot of people watching debate play out now, it seems like uh, something new or a tale that started with the opening to China in the 1970s, perhaps. And what is, uh, you know, in part so amazing about Marshall's experience here is that it's a pattern that he kind of, in some ways, begins with, mm-hmm. with, with this mission, but he really lives it in, in the mission and its, and its aftermath. And you see the cycle of um, this kind of projection of American hopes and desires and expectations. Um, great reluctance to give up that wishful thinking and those hopes, even as evidence against it starts to accumulate. And then um, a really um, kind of bitter backlash and round of kind of recriminations and charges of betrayal and weakness once those hopes fall apart. And I think there's something uh, resonant about that experience in our, our moment today. Um, you know, the, the reaction to that in the Who Lost China debate was toxic and self-destructive. and ended up doing um, great harm in its own right. And you kind of and to that, this country, not just to, to, to this country, especially, I think. Yeah. Um, and you kind of hope that we'll be a little bit uh, smarter about it today. But it's mm-hmm. probably uh, not a great bet. You know, for any of you who are interested in America as this sort of constant, you know, suitor of Chinese solutions, the, the first book that Jonathan Spence ever wrote was called book. To Change China. And it's a series of little profiles throughout history of people who, in one way or another, through religion, education, diplomacy, business, whatever, have tried to change China. And I don't think there's a one of them that doesn't come up a cropper. Uh, right. So it's a, a, it is a graveyard in a kind of a curious way. And yet, uh, hope does seem to spring eternal. It, it does. And uh, I mean, what is so amazing and kind of rich in this historical moment is that you have this incredible array of Americans with very different visions of what, how China should change, but who have all kind of uh, been there for years. Some of them are missionaries who have um, uh, religious aspirations. Um, some of them are uh, communist sympathizing journalists. Some of them are um, you know, businessmen. And they all have these uh, grand aspirations for what they're going to do. And they all are, are uh, disappointed in different ways. So what is this this sort of American um, impulse to sort of project out on another country that we can help them find the way? It, the, that is a, a deep philosophical question <laughs> that I'm, I'm not sure I'm uh, entirely qualified to answer from this book. But, you know, what... Um, well, Marshall it, sure had it. Marshall, Marshall sure had it. And, you know, it's something that feels, uh, you know, as I've watched American foreign policy in my lifetime... It feels like a, a hard-won lesson, and you know there's something on the one hand um, a little distressing to see that it's a lesson that we seem to learn and then forget over and over and over again. Um, at the same time, there is something comforting uh, in the fact that at you know this moment that is mythologized as this great age of American foreign policy and leadership, uh, you know the, the, these guys were not perfect and mm-hmm. went through that same process. I mean, this is the era of Marshall. Kennan is coming up. Atchison. Right. I mean, these are the great it's the wise president men, the greatest of the creation. Generation. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, exactly. And and the sort of the high tide of American efficacy. Right. And uh, and you see their flaws at just kind of you know again and again and again, which doesn't you know undermine the regard that I have for them. But you know, one one um, kind of really striking moment that uh, I've kept coming back to is you know Eisenhower, who was Marshall's protege, was created by by Marshall during the war is running for president in 1952 at McCarthyism's height. He turns and on Marshall. Exactly. So he's, he's campaigning in Wisconsin on stage with Joseph McCarthy, who has just called uh, Marshall a traitor or front man for traitors and um, really kind of made his life miserable. And Eisenhower, who owes his entire career, is there only because of Marshall, fails to stand up for him. 
And it's, it's a reminder, you know, we kind of think of these figures in kind of mythic terms, but um, they're, they're just as bad as anyone, uh, anyone today. I know, and, you, and you, you, you look at this sort of political pandering that goes on, right. certainly to the 10th power now, right. and you wonder uh, how is it possible for anybody to kind of keep a consistent policy or you know, w any sense of loyalty or constancy. And, right. uh, uh, I'm sure it was very painful. I think you, you write that it was for Marshall to right. have, have Eisenhower turn. Well, well he, Marshall always claimed Mar Marshall was this just stoic character um, and kind of cultivated this very stoic image. But um, I found this, and, and he said to Eisenhower, look, don't, don't worry about this moment. Um, you know, I understand that's politics. It's a terrible business. Um, but I found this touching exchange in the papers of a uh, former aide to Marshall, Catherine Marshall, Marshall's wife, um, writes this aide and says, look, it would be really great if you could go to Eisenhower and ask him to say something nice about, about George, which suggests that there was a kind of uh, hurt. underlying hurt that he never mm -hmm. expressed. Mm -hmm. And he did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, Eisenhower repented for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a rare, a rare commodity these days. Repentance. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> We're being signaled by the... Uh, okay, so we've question. just had our signal uh, that we are going to now turn to you. So, for your questions. So, right here, you'll get a microphone, um, and please tell us who you are. No, well, that's, uh, I was going to choose the guy in the back there, because it's, and then we'll take you. Um, tell us who you are, and keep your questions blessedly simple. My name is Joel Summer. And we were talking about the CCP, which Marshall at one time thought we were reformers. Now, what was his opinion of the KMT? I know at one time he cut off all military supplies to them for six months. So describe the KMT. So Mar Marshall had this, or the, the KMT is the, the nationalist, the Guomindang. Um, he had this almost tragic sense of them. He saw... Chiang Kai-shek as, um, in some ways, a very admirable leader. He did not think he was um, personally corrupt. He thought he had um, um, leadership qualities that were, that were admirable in certain ways. But he was surrounded by um, corrupt officials, uh, commanders who had kind of local interests that did not reflect um, any kind of real strategic considerations. And so Marshall um, approached them with incredible frustration because he again and again um, thought he saw opportunities for the nationalists to um, show leadership and turn around um, the civil war as the communists started to win that he did not think that, that, that they would take. So he always had this um, very, very tragic sense of the, the course of, of nationalist power. Um, and when he, when he looked at the, the communists, you know, he, he did not buy the line that they were um, real reformers, but he thought that with the right kind of constraints, they could be they could be made into it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, right here. Josita Capriati, Foreign Policy Association. I would like to reply to what Orville said about nobody has ever managed to conquer China. Uh, I would like to remind the audience that the Italian monk Matteo Ricci went to China, I believe in the 15th century. He went there with the mission to convert as many Chinese as possible. But after a while, he realized that that was not going to be his mission. He spent the rest of his life in China. He only converted maybe 200,000 people, no more. But what he did instead, he promoted the knowledge of science, astronomy, and math. And for that, he received the highest honor of being buried, I believe, in the Forbidden City or in some prestigious place in China. Well, uh, if I may uh, just add a quick footnote to that. I think what happened was that Matteo Ricci didn't convert so many Chinese, but he got converted himself to Confucianism. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is an important thing to remember. And, and that's true of a lot of figures at this time as well who yeah. really get kind of taken in by, by their experiences one way or another. That they, they kind of go native. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's an interesting question of who changes whom. OK, let's see, right here. Hi, my name is John, John McCann, and I'm the grandson of a missionary who went to China in 1895. My father was born in Beijing. Uh, lived there a good part of his life, came to school, went to Harvard, 
was recruited by the OSS, went back to uh, Asia during World War II, and ended up working with the Marshall Mission as What's a low-level, his name was uh, John Colonel, I think he was a captain, not sure what his, his rank was at okay. that time, but he was in the, uh, he later went into the CIA, mm-hmm. but his cover was he was in the U.S. Air Force. Okay. So he did serve under the Marshall Mission, mm-hmm. I've heard a lot of stories, but what I wanted to bring out was his brother, I want to talk about McCarthy and my father and what mm-hmm. happened later. Uh, my father's brother, older, uh, was a businessman in China, and he was somehow persuaded to stay on after, you know, the revolution, uh, and because he imported large vehicles, big trucks, and things like that, and he was felt he felt that it was that you know he was optimistic about, and he all he knew was China. He lived in China his entire life, so he was going to try to stay. Things, of course took a darker course, and he ended up in prison, and my father uh, being in the CIA, and he, he came under McCarthy's um, uh, microscope mm-hmm. and almost lost his, his position. He was sort of, he was actually, he was banished uh, in the 50s, uh, if you can imagine being banished to Rome and then to Paris <laughs> as being banished, but I, I mean, he lost his, his place in the you, you know, in the sort of uh, East uh, East Asia, which he right. was an expert in. So, but I'm anxious to read your book and see but, how it all works out. That, that, that's fascinating. I mean, there were so many of the of the characters, especially some of the the younger ones in this book, whose um, lives are really upended and in some cases destroyed by McCarthyism. A few years later, there's a um, a character whom Orville knew, uh, John Melby, who was a young diplomat at the time. Um, one of the kind of amazing voices in the book is he was having an affair with Lillian Hellman, who was a very prominent um, screenwriter and playwright and kind and of famous figure here. And having affairs with lots of other people. She was having lots of, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so he's, he's writing her kind of daily love letters from, from China at the time, which are kind of uh, a, a combination of kind of sad late night text messages basically where he asks her why <laughs> she's, she's not writing him more letters um, but then also kind of describing in incredible detail what is happening with the, with the mission and you know it's in part what's happening in the meetings but also you know the gossip at parties um, he is one of the people who then a few years later like your father uh, comes under um, McCarthy's ire he ends up getting expelled from the foreign service and kind of banished to Canada eventually um, but it's, it's true of kind of an amazing number of people who uh, were there at the time. Many of them, some of them were kind of taken in or naive about communism. Some of them just said, look, I think that Mao is going to be the stronger force here. And for, you know, saying that, they, they, their careers were really destroyed. But, you know, uh, Dan, apropos of being naive about communism, um, I think there are many different periods in American history where there is a strong complement of people who sort of give them the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. So it isn't character, uniquely characteristic to this period. Right, right. In fact, some of the most intelligent people who spoke the best Chinese, who lived their whole lives in China, were the ones who bought into that right. idea, which at the moment wasn't completely illogical. Right. It's just in retrospect it turned out to, to, to look bad. Right. But so then the State Department got completely defoliated of all of these people and had no one there for, for two decades. Right. And when you get to Vietnam, you have and, a, and you, it would be handy to have some Asia experts around. Yeah, they they're, weren't they're not there. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was quite, quite a, a skid mark. Okay, uh, right here. And then, then back there. Thank you. Uh, Robert Delaney with the South China Morning Post. Um, Daniel, you said, uh, I, I believe you said we're in a state of collective dismay about... China's uh, failure to live up to our expectations. So I just wanted to connect uh, what we're talking about to what's going on now Mm -hmm. uh, in the trade action between the two countries. uh, Both the Trump administration and many lawmakers in Congress are uh, saying that they expect China to open up its markets. Uh, We just had President Xi Jinping a couple of days ago pledging to do just that. Are, is this just a, a replay of China, uh, China's leadership saying what they think that Western leaders want to say and then trying to figure out a way not to actually fulfill the, uh, the pledge? Thank you. Well, I, I, I would not um, 
you know, the ghost of Marshall would uh, would be angry if I kind of use the analogy of this story to make a definitive judgment about 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 the present. But I, th I think the the kind of echo here is um, that you have to be very careful about wishful thinking and look at uh, you know it's it's easy to kind of get swept up in in, in hopes and vague expectations. Um, but ultimately, the you know in, in, in this story, it was the the underlying details that turned out to matter, and that wishful thinking was given up uh, very very reluctantly. I mean, I think in your question is is a really important one, and I'd be curious to get you to elaborate a, a little, Dan. Um, I mean, is it possible? And in one but one point, someone actually says Stimson says this. He says, uh, no permanently safe international relations can be established between two such fundamentally different national systems. <laughs> so I think embedded in your question is that very uh, 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 thought. I, I, is it possible for the United States to actually have a real rapprochement with a, like a one-party system and a state, uh, you know, state-run economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So, right, so, so the, the Stimson statement is about the Soviet Union, I believe, if yeah. I remember correctly. Um, I think, you know, Marshall goes from this, this is his first kind of um, real diplomatic experience, but he goes on to become one of the most important diplomatic figures or statesmen in, in, in American history. And what, what he comes to see is that you have to, um, you have to look at the world through the eyes of that one-party system and understand what is driving um, the leader in question, whether that's Stalin or Mao or Xi Jinping today, um, and and understand what their interests are and act accordingly, not act um, based on what um, you know high-level agreements are or what our our our, our wishes are. Mm -hmm. um, and and that I think is the the lesson. It's not that there is no um, possibility for diplomacy. It's not that there's no potential solution to um, a mounting trade war. It's that we should not expect that um, easy solutions are going to really take hold. You know, Marshall kind of comes away from this, and you know, he knows from his career in the military that there's not, you know, there's no easy war. But he comes to see here that peace is just as difficult. And you kind of hear him mm -hmm. as he becomes a diplomat saying again and again, um, you know, war, war is a lot simpler than what I'm dealing with now. Just to, I, I don't want to preoccupy this, but quickly, mm -hmm. where do you think it, it, it played a big role in Marshall's view of the world? Where do you think the whole question of democratic governance should sit or can sit in our negotiations with China, whether it's over trade or whatever? I mean, that idea that they should become more, more open, more democratic. Um, so, you know, er, 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 early in this mission, it's the kind of expectations are... Um, are you know kind of incredibly ambitious. There was kind of a very expansive vision of this. Um, if I had to, you know, there's a, there's a. It's easy to to um, have excessive hopes in the present, but uh, I think that there has been meaningful work done on governance and on other reforms that have made a difference in in China and have, have probably been good for the U.S.-China relationship over time. It's about keeping those hopes very contained. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, be, and, being, and being modest about them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Uh, in the, right in the uh, mirror. Yeah, right there with the woman with the black. Yeah. Thanks, Orville and Dan. And Dan, thank you so much for an absolutely fantastic book. Um, I had the opportunity to read it several months ago in draft form and can assure you all, Dan has not planted me in the audience, but that you should absolutely <laughs> buy it. It's, it's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, on the subject of connecting the Marshall Mission to <coughs> contemporary issues with China, um, I would like to sort of uh, push you to or press you to go a little bit deeper on um, channeling Marshall's ghost uh, with respect to some of the issues we're dealing with today. In particular, when it comes to the China reckoning, um, if you will, that we're having in, in our contemporary debates, in particular in Washington, um, if one consults Chinese strategists and, and um, officials about what their gripes are with the current international order, they will often, in fact, point to this very period essentially um, the fact that they
they were supposed to be treated as one of um, the four policemen at the end of the Second World War, um, that we backed Zhang inexorably, um, that we continued to back him after he had clearly already lost and de uh, decamped to Taiwan, went on to exclude them from the United Nations until the 1970s, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, some of this may be um, ex post storytelling, but some of it is, is a clear part of um, a narrative about uh, what China sees now as the fundamental injustices in the international order um, that the United States built um, po post World War II. I wonder um, if you can either, because you saw something in your deep archival digging or just channeling Marshall's ghost, comment a little bit on what Marshall thought about the way US policy evolved after China was lost um, in that period uh, during the early Cold War and before Nixon went to China. Specifically, yeah. knowing all the players as he did, <laughs> did he think US policy should have been sort of so absolutist in its backing of the Republic of China and of democracy? Or did he think there was more of a gray area that might have been pursued with the communist government. Um, so, one 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 historical note that I think is I, I think you're absolutely right about the the role that this moment plays in the Chinese narrative of of this period and kind of the international order more broadly. Um, the lengths to which the United States went in this in this moment to anoint China as a great power and a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council over the skepticism skepticism of everyone else in the world is just kind of striking. You know, FDR especially just had this notion that China should be included in this great power club. And Churchill thought it was ridiculous. Stalin thought it was ridiculous. So it really was this kind of American creation, I think, to the regret of, of Cold War policymakers. Um, after Marshall, Marshall leaves government, and one thing that is um, tough about saying anything, especially concrete, is that he's a pretty, um, he's a figure who is not prone to kind of comment about things publicly he does not keep a diary. He does not. He never writes a memoir very famously because he's. Um, he says he'll have, either have to lie or say nasty things about friends of his, and he doesn't want to do either. So um, you don't get a kind of clean pronouncement. But he, um, <clears throat> on, on on the one hand, as the Cold War really begins, he becomes Secretary of Defense during the the Korean War, um, supports a fairly hard line against communist China, but is also, um, especially as McCarthyism starts to shape policy-making debates in the U.S., um, keeps cautioning people around him and some of his um, protégés who then become senior policymakers themselves um, not to let that obscure a possible rift between the Soviets and Chinese. And, you know, one thing that is very striking, you know, we think of the, um, of American policy focusing on the possibility of, of, of rapprochement with China much later, but you see in, in right after the revolution, um, people like Kennan and Marshall talking about that possibility, and in part because of McCarthyism and the, the fierceness of that political reaction. Um, it's very hard for anyone who sees that in the kind of, you know, 50s and 60s to, uh, to do anything about it. Uh, right here, question. Yeah, sure. I'm not sure about this. Uh, tell us who you are. Joe, my name is Joe Weber. Uh, I'm not sure about this, but I always thought that even before McCarthy, people thought that the Chinese communists were offshoots of the Russian Bolsheviks. And if that were the case, why would anybody in the world think that you could negotiate anything with them? I mean, Lenin, I think, set the standard pretty clearly about that one. So that was a, um, you raised a really interesting point. That was the kind of crux of the debate at this moment in the, in the United States. Are the Chinese communists um, permanently allied to the Soviet Union, or is there a chance to, to break them off? Um, what is complicated about this moment, in retrospect, um, you can tell a, a fairly straightforward story. But at the moment, we had just been spent World War II, um, most of World War II, uh, working with Stalin as an ally. And, going through a series of agreements and plotting out the post-war world. And there was a kind of slow process of recognition that a lot of those agreements were going to come apart. So in 1945, there was uh, some basis for thinking that there was grounds for agreement. And there were still kind of summits between um, uh, Stalin and the United States and, and the UK um, plotting out a common vision for the post-war world. And it was only as those tensions really started to uh, come to the surface later on that this kind of negotiation looks so um, 
look so fanciful. But. And we had the Dixie mission up with Mao right. Zedong and with the communists, which is very friendly, very right. collegial. Um, and and um, so, so there are, there are real reasons for thinking through the war and afterwards that there might be a different, a different future. And it's easy to kind of see the signs that that was not really going to turn out in retrospect. But when you read the accounts of some very, very uh, smart people who speak the language and have spent their lives there, uh, many of whom are, are right-wingers, mm -hmm. um, they can kind of uh, see things playing out a different way, which is part of what makes you know, the moment so fascinating, because you really can see alternate futures and kind of what-ifs. So, Dan, just final question. Let me ask you, how do you think, um, I mean, things seem to be getting more and more fraught between the U.S. and China. How do you see this all playing out? So, I, I mean, I, the, um, at Foreign Affairs, in my day job, we published a piece called The China Reckoning, kind of taking stock of um, this moment where our expectations about Chinese reform and um, its diplomatic posture have really um, kind of turned out to be uh, overly optimistic. And that has prompted a, a you know, a, a big debate, including a, a very interesting one in this is within Kurt China. Campbell file. This is Kirk Campbell and, yeah. and Eli Ratner's piece. Um, I think that you know, looking at it, especially from the perspective of the mission and and the period in the aftermath, um, trying to reset from that and uh, look at things relatively dispassionately from where we are, rather than getting consumed in debates about um, you know who lost China this time around. I think if we end up in another version of that debate. We're unlikely to arrive at the right policy solutions, but if we can kind of step back, do away with some of the, um, you know, what turned out to be more fanciful hopes of the last couple of decades and think about policy in a, in a relatively dispassionate way, we're much more likely to get it right. Do you think we can develop a, a new sort of modus operandi with <coughs> China that doesn't, uh, you know, that has a fundamental stability without any regime change? You ask, you ask a gigantic question. I think that um, stability is probably too much to hope I, I, for. Regime but, change in maybe either country. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah, that, 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 is, that is fair. Um, I think there will be a combination of competition and cooperation in that relationship, and it will be unstable and complicated for a long time to come. Well, listen. Um, this book is not only uh, beautifully written, it's an amazing story. It harkens back to a time actually where the U.S. and China, despite all the trouble, was, did interact very well. Uh, there was, a, you know, the, for all what that can be said about the nationalists and John Kai-shek, you know, there were, was a group of people who were comfortable on both sides of the divide, and there was a tremendous amount of friendship, interaction, common interest, that I would have to say I see sorely missing today. So that in its own right is a, it makes me very wistful to read this book. So Dan, thanks for coming here. Thanks for writing it. And people, Thank you so much. You can have this lovely book and you can even have Dan's signature if you repair to the lobby after the talk. Thanks for coming. Thank you.